My name is Isabel Landasho, and I'm the program coordinator with the ANH Academy and Imana program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, thank you very much for joining us on our second webinar series co hosted by the ANH Academy and GIZ and Social and Behavior Change for Improved Agriculture and Nutrition. Today's webinar will be on how to understand the barriers and motivators to behavior change. I hope most of you know about the NH Academy and our Academy members, but in case if you're not, um, the Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Academy brings together researchers, practitioners and policymakers working for better nutrition and health through improved agriculture and food system. With members from over 100 countries, the ANH Academy is a global network and platform for sharing research and evidence, capacity strengthening, and collaboration across diverse disciplines. Um, if you're not a member yet, we encourage you to sign up and join on our website after this webinar, and it's completely free. Um, as well as convening technical working groups and um, hosting webinars like this one and curating a blog, uh, we also have an annual meeting of agriculture, nutrition and health community called ANH Academy Week. We, we held this year a um, conference which is called ANH 2020 just a month ago and we invite you to explore um, conference resources on our website. Um, thank you very much for joining us in this webinar and over to you Cecilia. Hello everyone, wherever you are, my name is Cecilia Gonzalez and I am a co-leader of the Act to Nut community. Today, uh, for the webinar of how to understand the barriers and motivators to behavior change, uh, we will have three speakers and I will introduce them in the order in which they will be presenting. So our first presenter will be Anne Jimerson and Anne is an SBC consultant with expertise in con conducting focus group research and design strategies. Anne has worked with large nonprofits and most recently as the behavior change specialist with Alive and Thrive's nutrition program. Next, we will have Peter Schmid, and he is an SBC and m and &E consultant and help, helping organizations understand and address key barriers and motivators to change, providing SBC and m and &E guidance to communities of practice. Peter has worked with several agencies in Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, and Asian countries. And our uh, last but not least presenter, Archana Sarkar, is the advisor for research in m and &E, uh, uh, GIZ India for Global Program on Food and Nutrition Security, Enhanced Resilience. She is experiencing conducting formative research on the key barriers and motivators to improve nutrition practices. Archana has worked for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Manta in projects in India, Bangladesh, and Tanzania. We'll start with Anne. In the first hour or so, three of us will make presentations, as you can see here. Um, I'll talk about who needs to do what differently. Petra will discuss key barriers and enablers. And then Archana will offer a practical field example from India. We'll then open it up to respond to your questions. Over several decades, SBC, or social and behavior change, has become really a mature field, and we have a lot of tools. One of the most recent is this practitioner's guide, Social and Behavior Change, Insights and Practice. The guide lays out five key steps in SBC programming. SBC is a process, and these are the five steps. The first is select the desired behaviors. Step two is specify the priority groups, those people who are expected to practice a given behavior. Step three is understand the barriers and motivators. Barriers prevent someone from practicing a behavior and motivators encourage them to do it. Step four, address the barriers and strengthen the motivators. And step five, evaluate and share. Today, we'll cover the first three. Future webinars will address steps four and five. Let's look at today's presentations and how they relate to the three steps. As you figure out who needs to do what, the who, is covered in step two and what they will do in step one. Peter's focus is on step three. Before we explore step one, I'd like to ask you a question. And here comes a poll. Which type of behavior change program is likely to have higher impact? Response one, a program that encourages people to practice many behaviors, or response two, a program that encourages people to practice a smaller number of behaviors. Looks good, it's, it's overwhelmingly lopsided. And you all agree with me that number two, 
a deep focus on a very few and very carefully selected behaviors is important. And the first reason, of course, is personal. Um, if you were to ask me to make four or five changes in my habits, I'd say, well, that's not realistic. I'd want to know which is the one that really matters. So prioritizing helps the people you hope will adopt a behavior. And second, when I'm planning a program, it's obvious that working intensively on one or two behaviors allows me to explore them deeply. And finally, a sharply focused intervention could lead to many people adopting a couple of behaviors instead of, instead of getting a little bit of change across a lot of behaviors. It's really a question of priorities. You can't change all behaviors at once. I'll show you the exercise, an exercise that uses data to rank potential behaviors in terms of impact and feasibility. This exercise is described in the SBC guide and in a short video from Alive and Thrive. The first task is to list all the behaviors that could potentially help solve the problem. A strong behavior statement always specifies who is to practice the behavior, an active verb saying what the priority group is supposed to do, and further details. Right from the beginning, everybody, program planners, staff, extension workers, researchers, evaluators, donors, everybody needs to be crystal clear about the exact behavior you hope to change. If it's vague, the program may drift off course. Now, using this checklist, take a moment to assess this statement, serves child diverse diet. What's missing? You probably noticed right away that this statement does not indicate who is supposed to practice the behavior. How about this statement? Starting when child is six months old, mother feeds child diverse foods. Much better, right? Now we know who. That's the mother of a child who has reached six months of age. So once you have a list of behaviors, you begin assessing them for impact and feasibility using a graph like this. On the vertical axis, we'll rank the behaviors on impact, placing those with high impact at the top and those with low impact at the bottom. You can see the words high and low there. On the horizontal axis, we compare the behaviors for feasibility. Behaviors that the priority group finds hard go to the left and those they feel they could easily do, we move far to the right. You will use evidence to see which behaviors fall into the upper right-hand quadrant because your program will be more successful if you focus on a few high-impact, highly feasible behaviors. I've seen teams use this exercise to prioritize behaviors for HIV AIDS prevention, agriculture, WASH, and other sectors. In today's example, an Ethiopian team aimed to improve the diversity of foods mothers feed children. The indicator for dietary diversity is the percent of mothers who fed their child from four or more of these seven food groups on any given day. On the left, you see a list of the seven food groups and a specific Ethiopian food for each. These food groups, as you see them here, are drawn from the evaluation instrument. The team listed all the potential behaviors on sticky pieces of paper, or what we call post-it notes, as in these green rectangles. Of course, what you see here are not behaviors, right? These are shorthand descriptions of behaviors because just because the entire phrase wouldn't fit on the sticky notes. With the complete phrase, starting when a child is six months old, mother feeds child blank every day, you see that each of these represents a behavior. The first sticky note then is really starting when child is six months old, mother feeds child teff every day. Teff is a popular grain in Ethiopia. And the second behavior is mother feeds child pea flour every day and so on. Next, the team ranked these for two types of impact. The first aspect of impact is really about which behaviors are most effective in addressing the given problem, in this case, under nutrition. The Ethiopia team looked at existing global data on three nutrients that are key for child growth, protein, zinc, and iron. Far and away, the most nutrient-rich food in this list is beef. So they placed feeds the child beef every day at the top of the impact axis. Feeds the child eggs every day was second. The least nutrition on the list was bananas, so they put it next to low on the impact scale. Here's how all seven possible behaviors stacked up in terms of the first aspect of impact, impact on health and nutrition. Now there is a second aspect of impact, what we call population impact. That is, what's the prevalence of the behavior or what percent of people are already doing the behavior? If everyone were doing the behavior, there would be no room for improvement. That was the case with one of these foods. The baseline study measured the percent of people practicing each behavior. Look at flesh foods at the top, 2%. Only 2% of their mothers fed their child meat the day prior to the survey. 
Compare that to 83% who had fed their child a grain. With 83% already doing this, there's no room to improve. So even though the behavior was relatively high in the first aspect of impact, the team removed it and placed it at the bottom of the list. Its population impact would be minor. The third way of considering a behavior is how hard or easy it may be for the priority group to adopt it from their point of view. The team listened to mothers to learn that families rarely had meat. Mothers said, we have meat only on celebration days, just a few times a year. So they left that sticky note for beef way to the left. Families found it very hard. You can see hard on the left of the horizontal axis below. About eggs though, the mother said, our chickens lay eggs and I could hold some back instead of selling them all. So they moved the sticky note toward the easy end. Listening to the mothers, the team determined that the foods on the far right were easy to feed to children and those on the left were hard. Before I show you which behaviors the team chose, what would you prioritize? Just think for a minute. Should the program promote beef or flesh foods? Meat could have the highest impact, but it would be a waste to promote it if families don't have access to meat. And what about grains? Extremely easy for families, but almost everyone is already doing it. Why waste resources to promote it? The team chose three behaviors. Mother feeds an egg every day, feeds pea flour every day, and gives milk every day. With the program focused on a few feeding behaviors, in just two years, dietary diversity increased from 5% to 25%, a remarkable improvement in a stubborn indicator. Now I wanna show you um, a recap of what we just did by playing a very short video. Let's take a minute to watch the summary. Let's review what we did to choose priority behaviors. With the tool, we looked at the choices in three ways. First, we answered the question, which behavior will have the greatest impact on child growth and development? Or, if every mother did this action, what would be the relative impact on the child's health? We used global data on nutrient density to rank the possible behaviors. Second, we looked at impact in another way. Which foods are Ethiopian babies not eating? Where is there room to improve? We used local data on the current behaviors to change the impact ranking. We moved the actions with little potential to improve downward on the scale. By looking at the actions in two ways together, high biological impact of the food on the child and lots of room for improvement, we discovered those with the highest impact. But before we decided to promote the ones at the top of this list, we considered the small actions that mothers feel they can do we used the horizontal axis to ask, how hard or easy is it? We had local qualitative data to rank the actions on feasibility. For this part, we did not move the small doable actions up or down, only from left to right. In our program's counseling, we can promote many important foods, but our mass media and community mobilization would really stress the value and ease of just two priority small doable actions feeding the baby eggs every day, and feeding the baby split peas every day. When you try this tool on your own list of possible behaviors or small doable actions, those that land here may be your most strategic choice of behaviors to promote. These have the most impact and are most feasible for families. So of course the choice of priority behaviors might be a little more complex than it looks here. In your sector, you may have to hunt harder for the evidence you need to identify priority behaviors. But surely you can build in some resources to search through existing data or reports, maybe from the government or even corporate studies, um, and sound out key informants, or just listen to members of the priority group. You will also consider a behavior in light of your mandate and resources, whether others are promoting it, and whether it aligns with government strategies, of course. In case you want to apply this process for your program, the organizers of this webinar will be offering you a link to a longer version of this video. Here's the first takeaway from today's webinar. With fewer well-selected behaviors, you are likely to see more change. And now you have a tool to select which behaviors to prioritize. So now we know which behavior to promote and who will practice it. The next question is why some of our priority group members do and some do not practice the behavior. By now, most people accept that knowledge is not the main driver of behavior. How else can we look at how, why people do what they do? 
Several years ago, the British Behavioral Insights team used existing research findings to create the EAST framework. They found that people are most likely to adopt a new behavior when we can manage to make practicing the behavior feel easier, more attractive, social, and timely. E-A-S-T for short, or EAST. Before I turn this over to Peter, he asked that I point out that many of the behaviors we try to promote truly are not easy. No amount of promotion may make them so. But for that reason, we may want to consider what will make them feel easier to priority group members. Here then is today's second takeaway. The, word, the key word here is learn. As Peter will show, you can learn, not guess, which are the most powerful enablers, how to make a particular behavior feel easier, more attractive, social, and timely. Thank you. Next up, Peter. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Anne, for the very useful guidance on how to select the most impactful and feasible behaviors. Anne has explained to us that people are more likely to adopt a behavior if you make practicing the behavior easier, more attractive, more social, and more timely. Well, in order to do this, we have to understand what are actually the things that can make the behavior easier, more attractive, more social, and more timely. And at the same time, what are the things that make doing the behavior the opposite, more difficult, not very attractive, and so on. So the question is, how can we understand what are these barriers and enablers? We have almost 300 people attending this webinar, so there is a lot of experience present. So let's try to answer this question by using a poll. So if you can please go to the poll function and choose one answer to the question, what's the best way of ident identifying the key barriers and enablers to behavioral change? So I can see that uh, there are not only many people attending this web webinar, but there are also many very experienced people attending, attending this webinar. Well, uh, you, could op you could notice that this question is a little bit tricky because in fact, none of the options uh, that were listed in the poll, they were completely wrong. None of them were completely wrong. But it's quite important that uh, we realize that if we want to change people's behavior, what matters the most is their perspective. It is people's perspective, the priority group members perspective that matters the most because we want to change their lives. So we have to understand their perspective. You can try to imagine it in your own life. For example, if your friends would uh, want you to start doing something new, maybe they would like you to start exercising or maybe to start, uh, maybe to change your diet. I think that you would like them to understand primarily what you think about such a change before they start talking about it with someone else. Well, this doesn't mean that, uh, this doesn't mean that the others, other options were wrong. It just means that the main way of identifying the main barriers and enablers should always be through conducting research among the people who are supposed to practice the desired behavior. And of course the question is, well, what should, what should such research focus on? So let's try to answer this question by using the perspective of the EAST framework that I'm presented. Let's first have a look at what, are the, at what do we need to understand to make practicing a behavior easier. You can use an example of a behavior that has been quite essential during the COVID response, and that is frequent hand washing with soap. The first thing that we should be interested in is what are all the things that make it difficult for people to practice the behavior. For example, wash their hands with soap more frequently. The second thing that we should be interested in, what are all the things that make it or that would make it easier for them to practice the behavior. So wash their hands with soap more frequently. And the last thing is uh, how easy or how difficult is it for people to access the materials or the resources or the services that they need in order to practice the behavior. So, in the case of our, in the case of hand washing the soap, we would be looking at how easy or difficult is it for them to access uh, soap and, uh, and and water. The answers to such questions can show us, for example, that the main barrier to hand washing is not what we commonly think like lack of knowledge or lack of soap, but the fact that people sometimes simply forget to wash their hands. Well, if our research shows that this is really the main barrier 
we can see that in, in such a case, we shouldn't focus on uh, the usual hand washing related activities, which is raising people's awareness, distributing soap and so on, but on something completely different, on helping people remember to wash their hands at the right moments. So you can see that uh, SBC research findings can quite often redirect the focus of our activities and they can make them much more effective simply because they are addressing the real and not the just perceived or assumed uh, assumed barriers. Now let's have a look at uh, how we can, uh, what, what do we need to understand in order to make uh, practicing a behavior more, uh, more, more attractive. There are several things that we need to learn. First, what attracts people to practice a given behavior Some, is sometimes quite different from the advantages from the benefits of the behavior that we promote. Let me give you a personal example from my own life. Physical exercise is promoted for its health benefits. So that simply people are in a better are in a better shape and they uh, and they can prevent a range of health problems. But for example, for me, a much stronger motivator to do a physical exercise, the things that uh, really makes me to move, is just that I want to feel good about myself. I don't want to see myself just as the guy who is uh, all day sitting in, from the com in front of the computer or on the couch. I want to feel good about myself and to feel good about myself, uh, I know that if I, if I move more, if I can see myself like as an active, uh, active person, this is something that, will uh, that I will find, like this is a benefit that I will find more interesting and will keep motivating me to do like a range of physical physical exercises. So that's why we have to understand what people who already practice the behavior appreciate the most about it, because these arguments can often be more powerful than the arguments for which we promote uh, the, given, the given behavior. Now, the second thing that we should understand is uh, what do the people who don't practice the behavior, what do they want the most in their life? What are they so-called key, key desires? And then link the, the behaviors that we promote to these desires. Let me show you, a, let me illustrate it at an at a example. There is a, lots of research showing how children that are born to teenage mothers are much more likely to be undernourished. So from the nutrition perspective, helping young women to avoid early pregnancies definitely makes lots of sense. When you look at this poster from Zambia, you can see that it promotes female, female condoms, but it doesn't say anything about improved nutrition. It doesn't say anything about delayed pregnancies or about unwanted pregnancies or about any other health, pro health problems. The main advantage of this behavior that the poster promotes is being a confident, independent woman who makes the best choices in her life. Simply because the people who prepare this, uh, this campaign found that uh, these desires are much more appealing to the priority group members than the traditional arguments for avoiding uh, early pregnancies or for using female condoms. Now, there are two more questions that are commonly asked in order to find out what can make practicing a behavior more attractive. And that is, what are or what, wo what would be the positive or negative consequences of practicing a given behavior? Now, uh, NGOs and UN agencies and other actors, they are usually quite good at promoting the advantages of a given behavior, the positive consequences, but we sometimes pay quite limited attention to the perceived disadvantages, to the perceived negative consequences. About six months ago, I was working in, uh, in Malawi where several organizations promoted improved uh, seed variety. And they were, of course, using improved seed varieties. It has a range of benefits. But when we talk to the target farmers, the target farmers, they were saying, well, you know, but we know or we heard that actually very often these so-called improved seeds that are sold in local sh shops are fake seeds, which that are not very effective, which means that we spent uh, lots of money, that uh, we might have a lower harvest if we use them, then we will look just foolish in, for, in, in front of our friends, and so on. They were able like, to list several more perceived negative consequences or perceived disadvantages of using the improved seed varieties. And uh, you can imagine that without addressing these perceived negative consequences, 
the organizations would find it quite difficult to encourage or to enable or motivate farmers to start using these improved improved seed varieties. When organizations are conducting research on what can make it more interesting to practice a behavior, they are using also several more questions, which is those that you can see on the slides. But at the same time, the answers to these questions, they can often be answered through uh, some of through the first, uh, through the research that focuses on the first four answers on this slide. As long as you have a good uh, interviewers, that can really go in, uh, in, in depth. Now, let's have a look at what do we need to understand if you want to make practicing a behavior more social. Humans, or most of us, we are quite social beings. We are heavily influenced by, by what uh, people around us do, by what they say, and what we think that they think. So if we know, or if we think, that someone that matters to us, for example, a family member or a friend, might disapprove of us doing a particular behavior, we are less likely to practice the behavior. And the same also applies the other way around. So the following three questions can help us understand who and to what extent can influence the priority group members. So the first question that is commonly asked in a SBC research is to what extent people who don't practice the behavior, so-called non-doers, think that the people who matter to them are in favor of them practicing the behavior. Simply, to what extent do they think that others, that, that others approve of them doing the behavior? The second question is asking, to what extent non-doers think that people like them practice the behavior? Here we are interested whether the people who don't practice the behavior think that practicing the behavior is something unusual, and they might, for example, look strange if they start practicing the behavior, or if this is something that is in fact quite quite common and if they start practicing the, the, the behavior, they will just join the flow and will not end out. And the last question is asking, is trying to find out who are the people that are or that are not in favor of them practicing the behavior. So it means it's asking who are the influencers so that we can uh, understand it and then start influencing these influencers. Let me give you an example about uh, social norms. Several years ago, Concern Worldwide was running a nutrition program. It identified that uh, among the main barriers to improve child nutrition is that many women are too busy with domestic tasks and they find it quite difficult to give their children the care and the nutrition that they need. Therefore, the organization started encouraging him, women's husbands to help with domestic tasks. So, for example, with bringing water, firewood, and so on. But the husband's response was that if they start doing what was perceived as so-called women's tasks, other men will be laughing at them and they will be saying that they are weak and they were bewitched simply because they are too much under the influence of their, of their wives. We can see that... Uh, Without understanding and tackling the social norms, it would not be easy for the organization to ensure that husbands provide more support. That's why understanding the existing social norms that influence the behavior is an important part of the SBC research. Now, the last part of the EAST framework is something that is called timely. The concept of timely has several different meanings, but let's focus on the two most important ones. The first thing that we need to understand is when are people most likely to be open or at least more open to adopting the, the behavior? Let me explain it on an on a example. Many of the practices that we frequently promote require people to use uh, resources that they sometimes don't have. It can be, for example, money or food or time. That's why if you want to, if you want, uh, to be more effective in uh, helping people to try the promoted behaviors, it's important that we promote the given behavior at the time when people have more of these resources. For example, in the case we would be promoting the use of solar irrigation pumps in the agricultural sector, the best time when to promote, when to promote this practice is after the harvest, when people have more money and they are more likely to be able to afford to purchase, uh, to purchase the pump. At the same time, uh, ideal timing is not just about resources. It's also about when are people likely to be interested in the behaviors that we promote. 
for example, promoting healthy child nutrition makes most sense during and after pregnancy, especially among parents who have their first uh, child, simply because uh, at, this, uh, at this time of their life, uh, they, are more, they are more likely to be interested in, in what we promote. They are more likely to be open in the messages or in, the, like in, our, in, in, uh, in our interventions. Well, ensuring such an ideal timing of our activities, of our SBC activities, and also of our SBC messages definitely isn't easy, but it can really make quite a big difference in the effectiveness of the work that we are doing. Now, equally important aspect of the ideal timing is to clarify for ourselves when are people supposed to practice the desired uh, behavior. Let's have a look at this image from a school in Bangladesh. We can talk to students about uh, hand washing with soap in a, in a classroom, but what matters really the most is that students get the message, wash your hands with soap at the time when they are supposed to practice the behavior, which means among other, after they use uh, a toilet. So what you can see is a photo of a very low cost nudging activity that uh, increased hand washing rates at, the, at this given school from 4% before these yellow footsteps were painted to 74% several weeks after they were painted. It's a really great example of communicating the right message at the right moment, the moment when people are supposed to practice uh, the given behavior. Now, we already know what data we should collect. So the next question is, how should we collect the data? What kind of method should we use? I again would like to pass this question to you, the participants. I would like to ask you, uh, what would you, the web webinar participants, suggest? What kind of methods would you suggest to find the answers to these questions that I just presented? Please type your suggestions in the chat box and I will ask Cecilia, our moderator, uh, to tell us what are the most common suggestions that you have. So we have uh, barrier analysis, key informant interviews, focus group discussions, qualitative methods, uh, talking to beneficiaries, face-to-face -face interviews, Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I can see I can see that there is uh, quite a wide range of uh, methods that you uh, that you know. So let's now have a look into a little bit greater detail at uh, at some of these at some of these methods. Uh, first of all, when we say that we should identify the key barriers and enablers, many people naturally think that we will need to conduct a special SBC research, but this doesn't really have to be the case. We can gain lots of useful data, even from our regular m &E activities, as long as we make them more SBC sensitive. Baseline or annual surveys, CAP surveys, uh, different activity, activity monitoring uh, initiatives, feedback from our community level staff, all these uh, m &E processes that you already have in your projects, they can answer many of the key questions that I shared with you earlier. For example, uh, we can learn how many people practice the beha behavior, to what extent they are aware of the promoted benefits, to what extent are they able to access the goods or the services that they need for promoting these, uh, for practicing these behaviors, and so on. There is really lots that we can learn already uh, through the MNE, uh, MNE activities that we already have in our, in our systems. So if you sometimes don't have the resources to do a special SBC research, just try to integrate these questions into your ongoing many &E, uh, &E activities. Now, among the most common methods that is specifically dedicated to SBC research is uh, what you already mentioned, and that is berry analysis. At this map, you can see that it was used in most of the lower income countries. So it's a very widespread, uh, widespread method. Uh, this method is using semi-structured questionnaires to ask people about each of the 12 factors that most commonly influence people's behavior. Daniel talked about these 12 factors during the last webinar, and you can also find their overview in the GIZ uh, SBC manual. The questions about these 12 determinants are asked to 45 doers, it means people who practice the behavior, and 45 uh, non-doers. When we compare the responses of doers and uh, non-doers, 
we can understand which of the barriers and enablers are likely to be the most influential. And this is a big advantage of using barrier analysis because most of the common methods don't really compare somehow in a uh, systematic way the responses the doers and non-doers uh, provided. Barrier analysis is suitable primarily for behaviors that are practiced by at least 10 to 20 percent of the population of the target population of the simply because uh, otherwise we would have difficulties with finding the doers. Very good news for those who would like to try barrier analysis. Uh, templates of the barrier analysis questionnaires in several different languages and pre-prepared questionnaires uh, covering more than 50 different behaviors are available at the behavioralchange.net website. I would encourage you to have a look at it and uh, use it uh, use it in your work. It can really save you lots of uh, lots of time. In terms of how time consuming it is to use barrier analysis, if you have a larger team of enumerators, it usually doesn't take one or one to two days to collect the required data and to analyze them per one uh, per one behavior. Now, another method that you might know is called the client journey mapping or sometimes customer journey mapping. It's a method that helps us understand the physical and emotional journey that people go through when they access or when they use a certain product or, or service. It can be uh, antenatal visits, veterinary services. It can be different social benefits provided by the or social services provided by the government. It can be, for example, solar energy products like certain lamps and so on. So this method can really be used across different uh, sectors. It's a very multi-sectoral uh, multi method. Client journey mapping is uh, gathering information through a combination of different methods, including interviews, observations, testing the use of the given service or product. And it's looking for what are the main barriers, what are the main strengths, or what are the areas where some weaknesses are experienced. To illustrate it on an example, just Imagine if the behavior that you promote is that pregnant women go for antenatal counseling or for nutrition counseling to a health facility. In such a case, you could be interested, for example, in where and uh, what did they hear about this, uh, about this service. You might be also interested in how easy it was to get to the facility, whether the opening hours suited the women's uh, schedules and possibilities. How long did they have to wait at the health facility? How do they feel about going to the health facility or how do they feel about waiting there? What do they think about the behaviors, about the attitudes of the health staff that they met? And what do they in general think about the usefulness of the, of the health, health counseling? Now, there is really no fixed methodology the, for, for using this, this method. The key is that you try to understand the entire journey from the person's point of view or from the person's experience. Another method that I believe all of you are familiar with are key informant interviews, which are usually semi-structured interviews with people who are most likely to have useful insights into the key barriers and uh, enablers. In my experience, the closer the key informant interviews are to the priority group members, the more useful insights they have. It is not always the case, but in my experience, very often it works this way. So who are the stakeholders that are usually quite close to the priority group members? Uh, of course, those are other priority group members, especially you can call them positive deviants, like people who already manage to practice the behavior, even though they face the same like social or economic circumstances. It can be extension workers, supervisors of extension workers, Another type of stakeholders that is quite often like, underrepresented in SBC research is people from the private sector. So, for example, sellers of agricultural methods, sellers of agricultural inputs or services. And it can, of course, be also field and technical staff of your organization or other organizations. Now, there is a wide range of other methods that you can use. Each has some pros and cons. For example, focus group discussions are very, very popular, but they are very demanding. Uh, they require you to have a good facilitator. Otherwise, it is not easy to ensure that you are able to gain objective data. You can be using trials of improved practices. It's a method that is based on discussing with people how their current practices 
for example, related to child feeding or preventing soil erosion could be made more effective and then agreeing on trialing improved practice. And then this experience of like people's experience with uh, trying this improved practice is then used to uh, enhance the project design. Another method that is uh, sometimes uh, quite underestimated is uh, observations. They often provide much more accurate insights than uh, other methods simply because it's one of the few methods where you can actually see like what and how are people doing as opposed to just uh, hearing about it. Another uh, recent, uh, method that recently attracted quite a lot of attention is uh, WASHEM. It's an approach that is actually using a combination of different participatory methods to research the key barriers and enablers uh, to, uh, to, to, hand, to hand washing. And uh, you can also take advantage of different already existing res uh, uh, resources, such as research done by NGOs, by UN agencies, academia, or experience from your recent projects. So you might now be thinking, well, it's very nice. He told us about many different methods, but uh, how should we decide about which methods to choose? My advice would be to use a combination of those methods that, you are mo that are most likely to give you the data that you need and those that you are comfortable to use. So for example, if there is no skilled facilitator in the team, then don't go for focus group discussions. Using a combination of different methods can help you triangulate the data that you get, and then it gives you a more accurate picture of the reality as, if, as opposed to if you were relying just on one source of data. If you like, you can prepare a very simple metric showing you what data you need and how you can get them. It can uh, just make it easier for you like to organize your research. If you just specify what's the main question, what's the research uh, method that can give you the answer to the question and whom should this research method uh, engage. Now, before I conclude, let me give you just a few very practical tips related to conducting SBC, S S SBC research. Always try to include the SBC research in your proposal, budget and time frame. Most donors, they have no problem with funding SBC, SBC research and it can actually make your proposal look better, more competitive, because they will see that you want to base your activities on facts and not just based on assumptions. In the case that uh, maybe you are new to SBC and you are, lacking, uh, you are like, lacking some experience, then just ask someone who has more experience with SBC for support. Even like more limited remote support can make quite a big difference to the effectiveness of your uh, of your research. If possible, try to uh, collect both quant qualitative and quantitative data. They will give you quite different types of information that complement each other quite well. And last and but very important point is that please try to keep your project strategy and also budget flexible enough so that you are able to accommodate the research findings. Because you definitely want to avoid the situation when you conduct formative research. You have great findings, you know what should be done, but you cannot do it because your project and budget is designed in a too rigid, uh, rigid way. There are two resources that I would like to recommend to you. The first is the Behavioral Change website, where you can find lots of guidance on all the methods I talk about. You can find there the templates of barrier analysis questionnaires and also guidance on addressing common barriers. And the second uh, resource is was already mentioned by Anne, is the DIZ FPC guides that covers most of what I just explained along the and also provides lots of additional guidance. So my last uh, takeaway, the third takeaway of this webinar is that we should aim for less guess and for more reliable, reliable data. We should make sure that uh, we, want, we are designing our behavioral change projects for activities based on uh, as, much, as much as possible based on facts and less based on uh, assumptions. So thank you very much for the attention and please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions or if you need any support. Thank you, Peter. Now we're going to have our last presenter, Archana. Thank you, Peter and Anne for the guidance on the social behavior uh, research. And yeah, good evening and greetings from India. Now I will present a practical example on the process and results from my SBC study in India, looking into enablers and barriers to good nutrition practices. 
so my uh, presentation will be kind of divided into three parts. It's firstly a brief description of the project on the food and nutrition security and enhanced resilience. And secondly, the, the second part will be basically on the processes and uh, the methods of a formative research on social behavioral change and also on the lessons learned and the implications of the project in the, of the of the research in the project as like uh, peter mentioned that how do we use that findings so first briefly on this project the giz food and nutrition security enhanced resilient project is part of our global initiative one world no hunger by the german federal ministry for economic cooperation and development also known as bmz and is being implemented in several countries, including India. France is working in uh, to improve the food and nutrition situation for women of childbearing age and small children in the age group of six to 23 months. Currently, we are uh, implementing it in 12 countries, nine African and three Asian countries. So uh, briefly, I will now uh, show you one of the key intervention to improve the dietary diversity through our two interlinked approaches known as participatory learning action, also known as PLA and the kitchen garden. So the participatory learning action is was one of the, our key intervention in the project where uh, it was it's a, it's a community driven tool to bring quality nutrition education for improving the dietary diversity of women and children. Uh, in this method, it's a, it, it's a very interactive tool. And in this method, we train the Anganwadi workers to give nutrition education to the uh, village women through 20 different sessions of trainings. And uh, we used very interactive uh, tools like cooking demonstrations, role plays, pictorial games, etc. And it, it, it actually involved women in a, in a much significant way. And in these meetings were monthly attended by 25 to 30 women in each village of the two districts to learn and adopt the gain, no gain knowledge into practices. PLA strengthens nutrition education and community uh, action to overcome uh, undernutrition among women and children. We also conducted a midline assessment in 2018 to assess the improvement in knowledge and outcome indicators. Where we found that, uh, as you can see, that there was quite good increase in knowledge on the selected practices of dietary diversity, which were mainly on uh, minimum dietary diversity for women. That is the minimum number of food groups that a woman should consume. And also similarly, the minimum dietary diversity of children, which the, the, the minimum four or more than four group groups that a child should consume. However, you can see that the practice was actually quite low much lower than the knowledge. So it, whereas 26% was only the practice for MDDW and 42% in MDD children. So from here, we tried to understand the enablers and the barriers for adopting these practices. So in the second part, I would explain that now this SBC research comes into view that we, when we found that there was a knowledge action gap. And uh, so here we uh, selected the main uh, practices for our research, which were mainly our outcome indicators, which are like, uh, as I told you, MDDC, which is minimum dietary diversity of children. Also the minimum meal frequency, which actually means the number of uh, times a child is f fed. And also the women's uh, MDDW, the minimum dietary diversity of women. So these were the key selected practices as we want to be very sure that where we are focusing our focus on the uh, SBC research. These practices actually led to these questions that what are the uh, enablers and barriers for our dietary diversity indicators. So basically, what are what are the things that prevents this woman from following these practices? That that is, what are the barriers? What enables them to adopt these practices so that we can take advantage from these uh, uh, enablers? And also, what can be done to overcome the main barriers and to take advantage of the enablers? So here we try to understand that what is that beyond the knowledge and beyond the available uh, interventions in the project that were actually hampering our um, our indicators and our, also our uh, use of uh, improving the dietary diversity. Now, in this uh, research, like, like we did a basically a qualitative study where we used a secondary data analysis as well as a lot of empirical data collection. Uh, we did 
almost 15 focus group discussions, uh, eight with mothers, three with husband, and also with the Anganwadi workers. Anganwadi workers are the, are the rural health workers uh, uh, in the community, and also with the other stakeholders in the in the community. And also we did semi-structured interviews and then observations uh, on um, on the nutrition gardens, on the meal, uh, meal preparation of children, on the feeding practices, and also on the nutrition trainings that were given. Now, I would like to give a little more focus on how we actually conducted the re this research. Uh, yes, so this is the research schedule. We actually had a terms of reference prepared for this. We invested a lot of time on preparing and reviewing the tools, a number of time, a very detailed enumerated training. And also uh, one of the things that we did is that during the data collection, we also did a kind of a data review in between to see that how the uh, data is kind of coming up. And uh, also, we also wanted to involve our partners, like NGO partners, so that they could be involved from the beginning. So we also conducted kind of a, a validation workshop with the NGO partners, where we discussed the questionnaire, where we discussed the findings after the data collection and everything. And uh, there was a big research team also involved into it. So Peter, uh, yeah, he was the uh, he was the international consultant for this project, and three uh, of the GIZ fund staff were involved. We also had two assistants for transcriptions and trans translations. Since it's a rural India, we also needed like you know for the male uh, FGDs we had male NGO staff facilitating us, and the, for the female FGDs we had female NGO staff, and then we divided the group in to basically two teams where there was a mix of everybody uh, who were the part of the COVE research group. Briefly, the findings uh, uh, kind of we tried to uh, focus on the key barriers and the key enablers where we found that the six uh, barriers and six enablers were there where mainly the Limited engagement of men was found to be one of the key barriers and the harmful traditional beliefs like something like uh, women should not eat lemon uh, during pregnancy or they should not eat green vegetables uh, after uh, after childbirth because the child may have uh, green stools and all these beliefs we found that they were quite hardcore beliefs which would not normally go with with knowledge and with demonstration so they needed a little bit of different kind of an approach so when then we used the enablers to to our advantage where we found that where there was a kind of a know-how of the anganwadi workers or the help provided by the household members and also the access to nutritious food was found to be one of the key enablers. Another group of women who were found to be was the positive deviants. Positive deviants are the ones who were like uh, those who were in the same condition, yet they could ma manage to have a better uh, nutritional practices in their household. And as we said that knowledge is not equal to action. So the key recommendations that we found was that, uh, that, that we have to engage men more actively the mother-in-laws and the positive deviants in improving the family nutrition. The Anganwadi workers who were the, who were the key pillars in this uh, area, they, they also needed more support in involving men in, 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 in providing support to vegetable gardens and all this, uh, th this way that so that the dietary diversity could be improved in this area. So promote low-cost vegetable seeds that are offered by the local shops, for example, government uh, could also use them for uh, distributing to these women. So these were some of the recommendations that were found to how to actually overcome the barriers and also take advantage of the, uh, the enablers in this study. And now we see uh, what were the lessons learned in, in this research and how, we, how well these findings could be used in our project. One of the key lessons learned in this uh, SBC formative research was that it is important that we do this barrier analysis or the formative research at an early stage of project to address them systematically and uh, to understand like what are the barriers so that we can start designing interventions around them uh, early on. And also from the methodological point of view, we also found that the interview guides, which we, because there were a lot of interviews, a lot of FGDs that we did, almost 23, 24 uh, interviews were done in total. So we found that, that the translation and of this uh, questionnaire was was playing a very key role. And when uh, when we were checking the data, we found that 
yeah the translations and that understanding of the each question by the enumerator was like a kind of a very key method in the sbc research so that every question is asked in a similar way by all the enumerators and that enumerators do not give answer in in asking the question to the mother so so these were some of the key things the key mistakes that we could you know identify while doing a sbc research so that because it's a social behavioral research which have to be like you know it's a very kind of a delicate kind of a research where you try to identify beyond the knowledge and beyond the you know beyond the so called answers we also found that uh, in our uh, lessons learned that uh, although we have we should engage the partners and staffs from the early on but however during the interview it's better that we do not have anybody's presence which could influence the women which could influence the men as a lot of normal norm normative behavior that women or the community try to express and it when you go in depth then only you can actually understand this hardcore beliefs hardcore thought processes in the in a in a society yeah and also the observations that was one of the key findings is that initially when we did few two or three observations we found that everything was so nice and everything was done so well like the nutritious foods were prepared for the children in the best possible way so then we understood that somehow that they wanted to show it that also that they, they have the best ability so to to actually capture the actual situation it's also needed that you make it little more of a kind of a, you know not a very uh, so that people are unaware of of, of it and they know that it's the, it's a normal process that is going on more like a surprise visit and also the data saturation is important because uh, you know uh, we did it after the two third of time uh, we just tried to check that if the data is coming repetitive now or that we have reached a data saturation level so when you do sbc research it is important that you understand when you when the data has been kind of saturated and there's no no much purpose of collecting more data and two important things that were very productive in our uh, in, in our research was this the data validation workshop where we discussed the preliminary findings with our partners and we um, invited them to give their thoughts and there was a lot of fruitful discussion and this also kind of fine tuned our research findings uh, quite a lot and once we have done uh, this we found that you know engaging the stakeholders from the early on of the research because they are the ones who would kind of use this research findings in their uh, in the practice and for the project as well as in the district for the government so we did a multi stakeholder workshop for kind of an action workshop kind of like this so where we kind of presented the our findings and also found out concrete doable actions by the government stakeholder as well as by the ngo partners so that this findings could be used in the uh, uh, in the existing uh, uh, intervention area so for example uh, like um, uh, we we um, suggested that and also they also thought that organizing nutrition focus meetings at the gram sabha which would actually involve all the village stakeholders which would have more male involvement so these were kind of started and you know at the gram sabha which is kind of a village panchayat in the indian setting and so these were initiated and then a, a small two pager was created which was circulated to all the district authorities all the district members who were a part of this uh, um, uh, dwcd or, or the department of women and child development in madhya pradesh Uh, and then also the mail involvement in ic material which was a key thing because most of the ic in nutrition is based on women feeding a child women uh, breastfeeding uh, you know it's mostly more focused towards uh, women so we wanted to make it little more male centric also so that we kind of changed a little bit of ic materials and also some example as the theaters and other sources where males could be involved and also where the anganwadi has more platform on the on the nutrition things so these were some of the way we actually made our research findings into a into an actual an action action kind of workshop to take it to the government and to the society yeah that's all in this um, small presentation and yeah uh, you can also uh, reach out to us if you need more uh, information on this and also our uh, this is our twitter secure nutrition which will have more information on the different country packages Yeah, Thank you so much Archana. So I'll just jump in right to the questions. 
I'll start with um, questions for our first presenter, Anne, uh, particularly on the example you gave about the, the practices of eggs and split peas. So I'll just group them so that you can comment on those quickly. But um, so what were some of the, um, what made these practices easier to practice? Uh, were the eggs and split peas available throughout the year? Uh, did the program do anything to make them available? And what was the result of this project? Did the mothers follow those uh, directions of the, the behavior practice? This was one of them was my question. <laughs> the other okay, one was great. from Marjorie Mar Maciera. Great, great. Happy to answer these good questions. Um, let me just speak first of all about eggs and split peas. Um, they were easily available all year in Ethiopia, but in the Orthodox households where this project was focused, families were really hesitant to bring any animal source foods into the home during the more than 150 fasting days each year. Um, the program engaged with priests then of the Orthodox Church and asked the priests to stress through sermons and other, other means that the church approved of feeding children eggs and milk. Actually, milk was one of the things that got promoted a lot every day to remind uh, families that children are exempt from fasting. So even though that was the case, many families were hesitant to do that. So pulling the priests in was a huge boon. And also the community health workers teamed with the religious leaders to add the message that it was safe to feed eggs starting even at six months. In terms of the results, I think I mentioned that uh, by focusing on two of the food groups that had been underutilized, the program really was able to increase the percentage of mothers who fed their children from four or more food groups. Remember that was the uh, indicator. So to reach four, um, they added these two groups, milk and eggs in particular, and went from 5% of dietary diversity to 25% of children being fed from a diverse diet. Thank you, Anne. Sure. Now I'll, I have a question for Peter from Poppy and Wandia, um, he says, or he, she, sorry, I like the example of what motivates me to exercise. However, it is also very complex as people have many reasons to be doers, non-doers. What happens when people identify multiple reasons why they don't practice a behavior? I think it's natural that different people have uh, different things that prevent them from uh, following certain practices and uh, those that are encour en encouraging them. Uh, you are, you are, the author of the question was right that we definitely cannot be addressing all the barriers and, uh, and all the motivators, but what we can do, we can identify those barriers and those motivators uh, that are most influential. That's, for example, what, where barrier analysis, perhaps combined with other methods, is doing a very good job because it is allowing us to go for uh, those barriers and those enablers that are relevant like to the highest number or to the highest proportion of the priority group members. And I might just jump in there to say that um, a good friend of mine once said that she could talk with mothers in villages about hundreds of barriers that got in the way, but if she gave them one really good motivator, they would jump over all those barriers and do the behavior. So I think that's our goal when we're looking for messaging is what can really be an emotional stimulus to people to do the behavior. And uh, there was a lot of several questions that came in comments about the involvement of men in the um, the research that you did, Archana. So uh, I will ask the question from Salome Bugacci. A good idea of involving men in the IEC materials and the process of the formative study. Were there differences between men and women's responses, and what stood out for you from the men's involvement in the process? Yeah, actually, uh, the men involvement in, in, a, in, a, in a society like this Madhya Pradesh, where it's a village area, it, it is almost minimum, like uh, uh, the men involvement. So uh, we found out that initially there were hardly men were involved in the nutrition processes, in the decisions of nutrition, where it is al always thought that nutrition is a woman's domain. So men actually felt very embarrassed to even answer the questions related to nutrition. So uh, actually we so we thought that, yeah, we found that this was actually coming as a big 
big barrier to nutritional uh, diversity. So there was we are, we are not getting enough um, results just to you know uh, even giving intensive training to women. So we involved various things like community uh, mobilization and also community group meetings, theaters where a more more men was involved. And uh, you know this is still a process kind of a thing, but you know we are also trying to do a more IC where men are involved. So so that this barrier is kind of slowly goes down and from the uh, you help a positive deviance and the supportive husbands uh, we are trying to kind of you know build this thing that you know that there's it is not it is actually a the nutrition is a responsibility of both men and women it's not the just the responsibility of women so this is a kind of a big barrier that we have we are trying to overcome that where involving men is becoming a normal process in nutrition so that we also found some of the answers where they said, you know, the other people will laugh at us if we say that we are involved in, uh, you know, we, we plan the menu or we cook or we try to feed the child or we help in feeding the child. So, you know, so this is the way that, you know, that stood, that stood out that uh, men involvement in nutrition is actually a key uh, involvement, uh, a key important feature in our area where actually the gender segregation is very, very strong in this area in Chhatarpur and Shivpur. These are like very um, districts in the remote of uh, the, the, in the remote of central India. So there were other questions uh, going back to Anne's presentation and the specific behaviors of what to eat. Um, so I'll group these two together. But so it says in Nepal, some of the community Communities are vegetarian, so eggs are not acceptable. What um, what has your research shown in such cases for better nutrition? This is a question from Abhishek Kadna, and also um, maybe in the in a similar realm from Nadine Bader. Um, he says it looks like feasibility and impact is looked at only from the health perspective, right? Thinking from the sustainable diet concept. I would like to ask how to incorporate environment, the environmental dimension from uh, the future perspective in nutrition practices. Let me start with vegetarianism. I, first of all, need to say I am not a nutritionist. Um, many children I know do thrive on vegetarian diets. It just happened that in Ethiopia, uh, eggs and milk were widely used even with children. So I think in a country like Nepal or wherever you live, where there's a, a tendency toward vegetarian diets, um, you can just consult with a nutritionist. They're, certainly the local nutritionists are up to speed on which of the uh, feeding practices might have the greatest impact on the child's body. Um, and of course, when you make the list to decide which are your priority behaviors, you just would not even list any animal source foods because they would fall off anyway. They would be unfeasible. So um, this one example was not meaning to say that the only way to feed a child is with animal source foods. And then the other question was on, um, let's see, remind me what that was. It was more like the um, environment. Oh, the environment. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, first, uh, you meant the questioner asked uh, about feasibility and impact in terms of health and nutrition. That was our example. Whenever you're using this tool, you're going to study the possible behaviors in terms of their ability to solve the problem that you are trying to solve. So you would not put, you know, impact on health and nutrition at the top. You might put impact on uh, better agricultural practices or output. Um, so obviously you start with your own problem and what would be the impact on that. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, it was undernutrition. And then you asked about the environment, and I'm wondering if you're talking about what's referred to in behavioral science as the enabling environment. That is, how can the setting in the household or the community nudge people toward a certain behavior? Um, and you certainly want to explore this as you listen for how easy or how hard people find the behavior already to be. And then when you get to step three, as Peter was talking about, you would explore the ways to make that behavior seem easier to people. Uh, there's a question for Peter uh, here, and it says, if your project's taking a market systems development approach and working through the private sector or other stakeholders, uh, so perhaps not directly with the priority group, are there approaches to figuring out the motivators and barriers um, 
for these behaviors? Is there anything different in how we should approach defining our behaviors, priority groups, and motivators and barriers? Yeah, so do you are right that uh, MSD approach or market systems development approach is dealing uh, with changes primarily at the systems, at the systems, uh, systems level. So this is a little bit different, but at the same time, when you look at it, MSD is uh, primarily offering the solutions. It's enabling people to access certain services. It's enabling people to address certain, uh, certain products. And it is doing so through taking advantage of the potential that market actors have. So MSD, it's really looking at, oh, okay, like we know or we have identified what are the, uh, what are the barriers or what are maybe some of the things that prevent, uh, prevent people from improving their lives or improving their, their livelihoods. And they are looking at how we can improve it through engaging different market actors. But to know how to improve it through engaging market actors, we still have to understand like what are the main barriers and what are the main enablers that people that people participate. And there are you know many types of research that are just called differently, or like many type many types of fields that are called differently, but they are doing pretty much the same. So when we talk about social marketing, when we talk about market research, when we talk about SDC research, when you look at them in practice, they are uh, they are focusing on very similar uh, very similar uh, topics. So I would say that uh, uh, what SBC is offering has definitely quite a big relevance to to MSD. To MSD. So I will ask a last question um, in post to all in. Uh, we can start with Arjana to answer. It comes from Antonina Mutoro, and her question is, how do you ensure sustainability of behavior change in some interventions, uh, like WASH, for example? Compliance is usually high at the beginning, but then it reduces towards the end. How can you ensure continuity after the program intervention ends? Uh, this is a very good question and very relevant thing as that, yeah, this is actually increases. When we started PLA, there was a lot of, uh, you know, interest and there were, and uh, for this, like, uh, one of the key important thing is that it is like consistent. We are doing it repeatedly. This behavior change is a kind of repeated process. So, so like that, we had like 20 sessions of uh, this uh, uh, PLA trainings that were going on. And also these were part of the, this. Now this is part of the government. They are, no, they are, they are India, they are known as Bangal Divas or by which it means that every Tuesday there's a meeting done by the Anganwari worker at the village level using this PLA technology or PLA approach approach where this this tools and techniques are used where cooking demonstrations where the hygiene methods the tippy taps and also the, the the traditional kind of filters where they cannot afford proper filters uh, traditional kind of uh, water filters so these are being repeatedly being you know uh, emphasized in the uh, in the community so that this will uh, this adoption become kind of a part of their their life so i mean it's a kind of ongoing process but uh, governments uh, ownership of this is actually a key uh, indicator that you know this is more likely to sustain in in it and also you have to kind of uh, think of the innovative methods also which could like you know interest them so it's like a, like a tippy tap method was quite uh, it's a very low cost thing and also children found it quite fun fun also because they could do it with their feet also so this is the way you can actually make out the ways so that it it, it, it keeps on the interest of the women and the children to adopt this behaviors any other comments, Peter or Anne? On, yeah, I on just this would question? like to uh, maybe sh uh, share my own experience with uh, like ensuring sustainability of the of the of the behavioral change that we aim to achieve. I use a very practical tool, and that is that um, at the beginning of a project, uh, I try to define what are the so-called preconditions for sustainability. It means the things that need to be in place so that people can keep practicing the given behavior even when the intervention is over. So if I would use a very simple example, if we are promoting the production of nutrient-rich crops among, for example, women, the things that need to be in place when the project is over is that they need to have access to affordable, uh, high-quality vegetable seeds. They need to have access, for example, to agricultural uh, advice. They need to retain their access to water. 
they need to have maybe their uh, husbands or their families support. Their children need to keep enjoying the meals that are made from these from these vegetables so that it has some nutritional impact. So I try to list all these like preconditions for sustainability, and then I work with the project teams on making sure that these preconditions are addressed already during the project duration. And I'll just jump in to say that um, I think that's absolutely right, Peter. I think too few of us think about sustainability when we first set up a program. And if we can anticipate it from the beginning, that's great. Your hope is always, as Archana said, to be able to reach a tipping point where it becomes built into people's habits and built into the environment to promote that. On the other hand, I want to just caution people that we always think of sustainability as the main goal and that somehow we should reach that magically. But if you look, take a frank look at something like Coca-Cola Company, who for decades and decades continues to barrage us with messages about how we should drink sugar water, they know that it doesn't just sustain, sustain itself. So let's not uh, hold ourselves always to that standard. Sometimes we need an ongoing program to make sure it continues, the behavior continues. I would say some of the takeaways from your presentations, I'll just think quickly is that it's, it's better to choose behaviors that have the most impact, but also are easier to practice and less behaviors rather than many is better. Uh, we should choose behaviors that are desirable, attractive, uh, that uh, have not only positive, but sometimes also negative consequences uh, to encourage people to practice them. People are social, so make them social, make it easier to practice um, by, by helping practice at the right time, less guess and have more reliable data. And uh, with uh, Archana, it was interesting in the results how the presence of the project staff was not conducive. Uh, it was better if they weren't there. And also that some visits to people was actually helpful in, in the research. Cecilia, um, I do see a hand raised. Hello. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Yeah, okay. Uh, greeting to all of you. My question is, when you have your, the behavior you are promet promoting involve uh, many groups of people, for example, when it involves children and women and men, they have different time when they are likely to uh, listen to you and to learn the behavior. So how you can know when is the, uh, the best moment for them, for the whole of all the group uh, to learn this behavior. Thank you. What I understood, uh, the, the question was, if you are uh, targeting different, different audiences, so for example, children and uh, perhaps like women or men or general, or general adults, uh, the question was about like their how or when would you uh, would you uh, would would you in, would you involve them? Uh, for sure, what I would say for sure you would not involve them like through using the same the same approach. Communication towards children would be quite different from communication from communication towards uh, towards adults. It very much depends on what kind of behavior we would be uh, we would be promoting. So, in which context or in which situations might people might be more most open uh, to be uh, to be, for example, adopting adopting such behavior or even like to be interested in the possibility of adopting the adopt, ad adopting the behavior. So, it all depends on the on the context. I don't know if Anne, you would like to add anything. I think that's exactly right. You need to listen to each of those audiences and uh, look at whatever data you have available to shape each of their behavior. Can any last comment? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, I, I think it's a very relevant question because even if the, the messages are similar, when you address each group, it also depends on the sociocultural context. Also, the how do you reach the target? Like we had women and children. So even when we reach to the women for women, for their dietary diversity, we had to use a different approach. When we, uh, you know, kind of uh, reach them for improving children's dietary diversity, the approach would be different. The, the tools would be different. The methods would be different. So yes, I, I think it has to be kind of very specified and very tailor-made that how do you reach to each group? 
what are the messages what are the timings of the messages like with children we would also in, uh, involve them in some of the ceremonies like in india this at six months we have called it's called a rice eating ceremony so you would involve them where the messages could be built around this um, uh, this phase so yeah this is very important that you target them for each group very systematically Thank you. Thank you so much to our presenters for sharing of your expertise and your experiences. And thank you to participants for all your great questions and comments. Um, we will uh, close the webinar now. Um, and yeah, you'll have a good rest of the day. And thank you.